Well, let's get to the reason we're all here tonight, Deb Liu. I'm really excited to host Deb tonight. She is now the CEO of Ancestry. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that company. Prior to that, she was a VP at Facebook for quite some time. Um, she's also a, one of the founders of Women in Product, which is, I hope a lot of you know about that. It's a great community um, for women that work in product management. Um, so you should definitely check it out. And uh, before that, she did. She worked in product management roles at PayPal and eBay. She's on the board of Intuit, which is where I started my product management career. I think it's a, an awesome company. And again, her Twitter handle is at Deb Lou underscore. Um, and so I'm really excited to hear what she has to say and in the discussion we're going to have today about how to overcome the communication bias at work that no one talks about. So Deb, with that, please uh, take it away. Thank you. I remember the first time I actually was asked to join the executive team at Facebook. I show up to the meeting and I am talking to, you know, I just, I, I see the, the really senior executives that have always run this company. And I realized something and I went back and I talked to my manager, Mike Vernal, he's at Sequoia now. And I said to him, I noticed that every single person in that room has one thing in common. They can talk about anything. They can talk about anyone, any product without any, any preconception. And we would literally talk about everything, whether it was the latest news, we would talk about the latest products, we would talk about trends. And the one thing everyone had in common was that they were able to communicate on a dime with no preparation. And he said, absolutely. And that's what brings them into that room. But, you know, if you think about who is successful in a workplace, it's not necessarily the people who speak the fastest. It's not necessarily the people who are the most vocal. And yet you see this communication bias show up again and again and again. And it's something we don't talk about. I, um, I recently wrote a, a post about how the secret, the, the secrets behind calibration and ratings and reviews um, and, and um, how we do promotions at companies. And that again shows up, you know, he did an amazing presentation, you know, we should definitely put him up for promotion. And I'm thinking, what if he's terribly, objectively a worse PM than someone who's quiet? And this happened repeatedly. One of my best PMs I ever worked with, she was an incredible leader, but she was extremely quiet. She show up to meetings, she get things done, her slides were great, but she just was extremely introverted. And when I put her up for promotion, everybody's feedback was we never heard from her. And I said, but objectively, she got the work done. She hit the metrics. She grew a business from nothing to hundreds of millions of users. How could you say that? And suddenly you see this bias over and over if you watch it. And you realize that this bias is insidious. And it's also dangerous. And it's something that we really need to think about as leaders, as product managers, as people who work in this, in this community. I think that it is something which is so pervasive and yet so dangerous that I wish we talked about it more. And I say this because I see this happening time after time, whether it's promotions or ratings, whether it's ideas that get funded or not. It is the people who don't need time to process, who can speak English as their first language or feel don't stutter or aren't neurodivergent. It is the people who feel comfortable in an environment to say anything at any time about anything. And to think about how that bias is so pervasive in our community and how we can address it. And so I'm actually gonna uh, talk about three different themes about how we can address this together. But as I go through this, I think sometimes you'll nod and see yourself in it, and sometimes you won't. And actually I want this to be a conversation because this is not just me teaching you how to address this, it's really us having a conversation about how we can change what looks like leadership in all of our, all of our work, in all of our cross-functional teams, and in every day when we are talking and communicating with one another. So the first thing I would say is there are a lot of people here who are introverted. So I don't know how many of you read Susan Cain's book, Quiet, but it is an incredible book because it talks about how introverts actually create so much value in the world and the workplace and yet get less recognition. And so if you're an introvert, as I was, I grew up never talking. In fact, I spoke so little that people would ask me like, you know, are you, did, people would ask me whether I spoke English. <laughs> and I grew up in a small town in the deep South and part of it was that I learned to kind of close in on myself. I realized if I didn't comment, if no one noticed me, if you know people around me didn't tell me where, to go back to where I came from, suddenly I would just, you know, I would be less objectionable. And so I hid and I hid that in silence. And it worked for me. Like I got great grades. I graduated number one in my class. I went to engineering school. I studied engineering for four years and almost said nothing at Duke through my four years there. And it was great. It worked until it didn't work. And then suddenly I found myself at Boston Consulting Group. And for those of you 
who work in consulting and work with client service, I remember not getting the highest rating. Uh, they said, your slides are great. Your analysis is amazing. But honestly, you're really bad at the client part of client service. And I remember being really devastated. And I said, what do you mean? I'm doing the work. And they said, yeah, but you know, you have to work with the clients. And if you aren't able to work with the clients, that is our bread and butter. You need to connect with the clients. And I just could not understand what I was doing wrong. And when I got to business school, that's when it really hit me. Because when I went to business school, I look at the rubric for grading and a third to a half of the grade is purely speaking up in class. It's class participation. And I realized I was really hosed because now I had to learn how to do this. And so one of the things I say to everybody who tells me I'm introverted, I struggle with this is learning to speak up, finding your voice is a skill. And so we have this communication bias. That is something that's not gonna to change tomorrow. And so if you can treat speaking up as a skill, you can make a transformative change in the way that you interact with other people. So I would start with this, let's start small. Let's say you feel uncomfortable speaking and that this is feedback you've gotten before, that you need to speak up more. So what do you need to do? Well, think of an upcoming meeting where there's gonna be a discussion, an open discussion of some sort. Decide now ahead of time how you wanna show up, be intentional. Pick a thing you wanna say, pick a point you wanna land, prepare for it. Then actually think about a couple things, like actual concrete things you're gonna say, that you're gonna comment on, you're gonna speak about. And practice showing up. I think sometimes, you know, it's easy to give yourself a free pass. And, and I talk about this in the second chapter of my book, you know, how to, basically the second rule is don't give yourself a free pass. And my friend, Caroline Zazaki, she's a trainer in Silicon Valley. She has this thing she calls, don't employ ridiculous, uh, unintentional, ridiculous strategies. An unintentional, ridiculous strategy, and I talk about being intentional here, is because she said, you know, how many times do you go to a meeting and show up, and then you, you think ahead of time, I'm not going to say anything It's me. I'm just going to show up to the Zoom and sit in the back and turn off my camera. I'm going to sit in this meeting, and I'm not going to show up. I'm not going to say anything. That's a ridiculous strategy. How often do you do that, though? And yet, how many times do you walk away from a meeting having done just that? You didn't engage anyone. You didn't show up in such a way that people even knew you were there. You didn't actually, you were, you, you know, if you walk into a room and you walk out never having said anything or interacted, did it even matter if you showed up? And so being intentional is the way to address this strategy, which is to say, pick a thing that you want to do and accomplish that. Find ways to think about it ahead of time. You know, the thing that um, that product manager I, I, I talked about earlier, you know, the thing that she said was, well, I'm a processor. I give her tons of feedback. Let's talk about how we can speak up more. Let's talk about when she wasn't presenting, she didn't say anything. When there was questions asked, she didn't answer. And she said to me, I'm a processor. And when I process, you know, by the time I process and I think of something to say, the conversation has completely passed me by. And, you know, think about what that, how fraught that is for her. So we would actually brainstorm, you know, hear the things you say, hear the answers that you're going to have ahead of time so that you feel comfortable and you're going to practice this. And by being intentional, she was able to address this. She was never going to be the most vocal person. She was never going to be the person who showed up and raised her hand and stood in front of the room voluntarily. And yet she was able to address some of these things by actually treating speaking up and finding her voice as a skill. And it made a tremendous amount of difference in her career. And I could just see her blossom. You know, it, it wasn't about changing her personality from introversion to extroversion. It was actually about is intentionality. And so for those of you who struggle with this, being super intentional about making those choices. And when you make those choices, actually afterwards, grade yourself. What does success look like? And did I achieve it in this meeting? And once you do this for a while, let's say you do this for a week, every meeting before you go in, deciding what you want to say, what contribution you want to make, what success looks like, and then leaving the meeting and saying, hmm, I did that well, or I didn't, and here's what I would do differently. That's how I taught myself to actually speak up. In business school, I was really struggling. When I first got there, I didn't say anything, and I realized as the, as the quarter was going by, I was going to get a terrible grade, and I realized I had to actually, I marked tallies in the corner of every class how many times I spoke, and at first, it was just about raising my hand. I just forced myself to raise my hand and say something. Then it was about the quality of my comments. Then it was about the richness of me participating in someone else's discussion. And it took me time, but by treating it as a skill, I was able to intentionally choose a path where I was able to succeed on something that I found extremely difficult. And today I feel a lot more comfortable speaking up. It is still hard for me. It's not my natural inclination. And yet I think that I've made tremendous progress in to be able to even have a conversation like this today. 
The second thing is, you know, we can change ourselves. And, and for those of you who, who change yourself, I think that that's part of the path. But what if we made it easier structurally in our companies, the way we run companies? What if we change that to make it possible for people who actually face this bias to work within our environment? And with that, I, I really look at something which is really being a leader and changing the process. So one of the things that's really important about being a leader is really thinking about the processes that actually holds people back. So, you know, for someone who needs time to process, for somebody who, who needs more time, for somebody who doesn't think of things to say at the beginning, it helps to actually look at the pre-read ahead of time. So one of the rules we set was that we would always send a pre-read 24 hours in advance so everyone could read, process, and decide what they want to say. That has made a huge difference in the way that we do things. Suddenly, people who need time are given much more time. But then the second thing I do is, if you're going to ask for solicit feedback in the room, actually ask people to fill out a survey. So the way we fill surveys out is actually we create like a, a, a Google sheet. And inside, we, white, we actually ask the question, like each person, we put everyone's name. And then we ask them, if it's a rating from one to five, you have to rank things. Or if you have to comment, we actually white out everyone's comments. You put in your comments and you turn the font white. So you can't see your own comments. But if you mouse over, you can see everyone's feedback. And one of the things about filling out these surveys is now you're able to see the feedback and then people can put comments in. And as a leader, you can actually look at the comments you find insightful and call on people. That is really tremendous as well, because now you're getting feedback from the full room, not just the three or four people who actually feel comfortable actually saying something at the time. The other thing is actually going around the room. Tell people in advance, we're going to discuss this. I'm going to go around the room and ask you for X. Warn them at the beginning so that they have time to process that. That means that every single person gets a voice and suddenly you don't have a couple people dominating the conversation, but instead structurally are creating opportunities for us to overcome this communication bias. And then finally, really call on the people who haven't spoken. If you see somebody who you know has an important opinion, you know that they've thought about this and you want their opinion, say, hey, you know, I'm, Dan, I'm going to call on you uh, towards the end of this meeting. Is that okay? Just give them a heads up, give them a heads up ahead of time because they filled out the survey or give them a heads up that you know that you want their voice. Really being a leader, but changing structurally how we do things involves actually changing the outcomes as well. And I have found by implementing these and we use these in Ancestry, it has changed the way that our meetings are run because suddenly you have everyone is on the same page when they walk in. Second is if there's voting or discussion, everyone's voice is already put into the documents. Everyone's voice is heard if you go around the room and you're actually catching the comments that didn't get spoken about. And suddenly you have much richer conversations and it does put the burden on the leaders. It puts burdens on those who runs the meetings, but at the same time, it opens up the conversation in such a different way. And then finally, if you are comfortable, if your workplace is rich and easy for you to, to have these conversations, but you see others who need help, you know, be a great ally. So first is to create space. I think one of the things that we don't do well is we don't create space for other people. You know, people who feel comfortable speaking don't think, well, you know, other people are necessarily having the same issue. And so create a space to do that. Actually invite the people you know have something to say. Tell them that you want them to help you do the X presentation or that you want them to take X slide. One of the things I found, especially amongst product managers, a lot of product managers are used to communication as part of the, the tool set that they have. But having the researcher on your team or the UX designer actually present their own work, that is such a powerful way to bring to the fore the work from people who are doing the work. You're not representing them. You're actually opening up the door for everyone to have an equal voice. And suddenly they get visibility. They get comfort. They have influence. And you're creating an, an army of people who are actually selling your idea and talking about your product as opposed to you being the single voice. And so as you do that, by creating the space, you're actually inviting other people in. And now they're amplifying their voice and amplifying their voice from there. But also for those who feel really uncomfortable, one of the things that my, you know, we were launching a big product and we were doing it all hands to the, to the company. There was going to be several hundred people there. And I asked the PM if he wanted to speak. And he said, no, I want my engineering manager to do it. And he spent hours and hours prepping our engineering manager. English was not his first language. He had never done presentations before. He actually barely even spoke at meetings. And he, you know, he, the PM prepared that engineering manager and it went extremely well. And it built, his, it built the engineering manager's confidence so much. And so really giving him the support, 
helping him with the script, working with him on the pacing, you know, helping him because he had just done so few presentations, helping him just understand the logistics of standing in front of a room was such an important thing. And suddenly his confidence went up and he actually, that engineering manager went on to do a number of presentations and he grew in confidence over time. And then finally, as a great ally, really reinforce and appreciate. You know, have you ever had that experience where you say something and it just lands in the room like with a thud? Nobody says anything, everyone's quiet, and they just sit there and they stare at you. And you you get into your own head. What if I said something wrong? What if this is the, you know, what if nobody understands what I'm saying? What if I'm I'm incorrect? And suddenly you're struggling with really getting inside your head. So instead, when someone speaks, actually say thank you for that comment. I really appreciate it. How do you know amplify it? Say, as you know, Dan said, you know, we should try this, this initiative in this way because this is a fresh idea. And I think this will help us execute better. And suddenly that small bit of appreciation and echoing really reinforces, hey, I said something. It wasn't wrong. In fact, someone actually you know, reinforced it and brought it to the fore at the end. These are small things you can do as allies to overcome this communication bias. Because here's the thing, like we are judging each other, whether we like it or not. I read a number of different reviews and I, I sit in calibrations for, for promotions and this bias is so real. You know, we have this affinity bias. We have this proximity bias. We also have this bias towards what people remember speaking. And as senior leaders at companies, you know, what they see is only 5% of the work. And 95% of it is invisible. And if this bias is actually taking over 50% of how the ratings go, think about how detrimental that is to all of us. So you being a great ally, you being a great leader, you being very intentional, each of these things will open you up and your team up to better, better opportunities, more investment in your initiatives, and better outcomes in the long term. Great. And so, you know, I wanted this to be a conversation. I think the most important thing about something like this is actually talking about some of the challenges you face. You know, I didn't want to spend 40 minutes lecturing and instead I actually want to make it interactive and talk about some of the challenges you face and how we can actually address them together. Um, this is, I, I love what you were short, but it was uh, impactful, uh, which is great. And I, you and I have actually not talked about this, but there's so much stuff uh, there and so much that I've reflected on from, from my career. So, um, I thought maybe Zeb and I can just cover, talk, chat for a little bit. Yeah. So I, first off, I would say I definitely see what you're, I see the thing that you're talking about. I've seen that in tech companies or just in companies in general. And um, one, and, and I got aware of it and into it as part of our, was one work group. We, we did some, we just, they just did some like personality assessments. They did Myers-Briggs for us. And so that's when I first learned about the whole introvert versus extrovert thing, right? And uh, I'm an extrovert, so it was great to learn about the introvert. And it was great that for each exercise, for each type of the different personality things, whether it's J versus P or N versus S or I versus E, they would split them up. And so I remember what they did is had they, okay, eyes, you all go over here, write down your impressions of extroverts, right? And, and then all the extroverts, write down all your impressions of introverts, right? So the extroverts are all like, yeah, the introverts are super quiet. You don't know what they're thinking. You know, they don't contribute. And the introverts are like, the extroverts are loud. They're dominating the conversation. They don't listen. They don't make room for other people to listen. So, um, so I, I definitely appreciate, appreciate that difference. And, I, and, and I'll just share two work examples real quick that I saw, what, I saw the same thing you did. There was someone in my work group who I knew was sharp. She was super sharp because I had worked with her, right? And then we were in some meeting and she kind of, the leader, the manager, asked her, like put her on the spot to answer a question. And she kind of like, was like a deer in headlights, right? And, and I was like, huh, that's weird because I, and then, then she went back to her office. She spent 30 minutes sorting it out. And then she came back and had an amazing answer. You know, it was all there, right? So anyway, it was, um, it was very interesting. So I saw that. And then the other example that I would share is there was a, someone I was interviewing. We interviewed this candidate for a product manager. And everybody just loved this person, right? And we were pretty methodical and rigorous. And we had like a rubric of who's going to ask him about analytical skills and who's going to ask him about this. And somebody was on the hook to ask about analytical skills. And we're doing the debrief. And they're like, well, he's an electrical engineer. So I just figured, you know, I wouldn't ask him about it. And we were kind of like, oh, man. We were so thorough. We're like, okay, well, what do, I'll just call him up. I was a hiring manager. I'm like, I'll just call him up. And I was like ping him real quick on some analytical stuff. And then we'll just check that box up. I put him on the spot with some analytical questions and he didn't do that well. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just in the moment, I said, how did you think that went? 
you know, he's like, not that well. And I'm like, well, and I thought back to the other person. I'm like, well, I know some people are smart. There's not good on the spot. So mm -hmm. what could we do about this? And then he said, and I was thinking the same thing, but I wanted him to say, it's like, well, you could give me a homework assignment and I could do it. And that's what we did. And he crushed it. And he joined our team and he's one of our best hires that we made on our team. Yeah. So, and I think just those two examples are a reminder. Like first, the first person, if other people in that room who sit in the calibration meeting, they think, well, she just doesn't know her stuff. Think about how dangerous that is because now she came back, but she came back, you know, maybe to a smaller group. And suddenly the impression people have that this bias is like, wow, she just doesn't know her stuff. And that is so dangerous. And I've heard people do this in calibrations and it's very frustrating because no, maybe she needs time to think about it and give you a better answer. And it is just a different way of processing. And that's absolutely okay. And the same thing for the second one, how the, an interview is literally the test of this communication bias. It is yeah. the ultimate test, which is people are firing questions at you. You don't know what they are ahead of time. And your ability to rapid fire, you know, volley is literally the whole interview process. And how dangerous is that? I have trained a lot of introverts on how to interview because I said, look, you have to like, if you need time to process, think of the three things you want to say first and then give it, say, hey, can I take a moment? Because I think sometimes you feel the pressure to say something, right? So if you're an introvert mm -hmm. and you're struggling with this communication processing, say, can you just give me a moment and take three notes, like three things I want to answer and just give yourself because mentally you could just end up with a hiccup and go, oh, I'm frozen. And say, so instead, I say, just write three words of what you want to say. Just give yourself, buy yourself time. And that will give your, it will kind of tax your brain less and give you more of an opportunity to answer well. But I love that, you know, he said, give me a homework assignment because, you know, how often is someone designing a product, you know, on the spot right. in their actual right. job? Right? <laughs> totally. And that's the thing is I'll, I'll, to, to yes and that people love to interview UX designers by saying, hey, go to the whiteboard and let's do this. And, and so again, that bias. Yes. If you're one of these, there's there's a lot of great designers that they do it in the quiet of their office. And of course, they collaborate with people. But I realize like that's, you know, that's not really. So we we would err much more on homework. Right. If you made it to a certain stage, we called it a challenge. Here's a design challenge. And we gave everybody the same amount of time to do it, you know, and then they came in and presented it. And but then they had a chance to rehearse it if they wanted or not. Right. Um, I would even argue, I like your tip about, can I take a moment? And I would say, you know, I've, I've interviewed a lot of PMs uh, in my career and anytime anybody says, can I gather my thoughts for a minute? I never had a negative reaction to that. Actually, it makes a positive reaction. It's like, oh my gosh, they're going to be really, now, if you sit there in, in silence for five minutes, you can be like, Hey, what's going on? But if it's just a minute or two, I'm like, that's great. And I'll tell you that I would add, it's actually beneficial for extroverts too, Deb, um, because an extrovert will tend to just start blabbing. And it won't be that well organized. It cannot be organized, right? So even thinking an extrovert saying, what are my three points that I want to make versus just rambling can come across a lot better. And I've seen that, for example, when I do podcasts, the difference between having like just a bullet list of what we're going to talk about versus just doing it on the fly. As an extrovert, I can totally do it on the fly. We'll just wing it. But the quality, I've seen the quality be better when you put some prep and thought into it as well, right? So um, yeah, and to your point, I, yes, sorry, well, I've had interviews where people start rambling and then actually a few people say, hey, I got off on the wrong foot there. Give me a second and restart. And I admire oh, someone who's willing to actually say that because that says I'm willing to admit that something didn't go right. And I'm willing to make a turn to the right or to the left or turn around. It takes courage to do that. And I really admire people who say, well, I think I'm going down the wrong path. Give me a second. And actually, when they correct, it's so much better, as opposed to trying to kind of turn the conversation back to the right thing. And, and I've seen people try to do it, but it's much harder, right? Because you have to tie it all back together. But just say, right. let's hit pause and let's actually start this again. I really, really admire that about people. Yeah. And to your point, I feel like interviews, it's, it's like machine gun question after question after question. So I was wondering, do you have any, I mean, you covered a couple of things, any other top level advice for people that might find this challenging in an interview, like in a job well, interview? Think, one thing for interviews is you get better with practice. And, you know, I think one thing is actually just practicing with a couple people you trust. I, do, I did mock interviews for many years, especially for internal transfers. And usually it was people who 
you know, really wanted to move over to product and struggled with the interviews because they just didn't know what was the expectations are. And so one of the things I did was I would do these mock interviews and I would say, hey, this worked, this didn't work. But I could see them improve. Like I would do two or three and you could just see them improve from the first one to the last one. And so even just three really quick, like five, 10 minutes, go through one question. Right. And so one of the things I would do is just like practice you know, practicing piano, learning a new language, like everything just takes a little bit longer for people maybe. And maybe you don't have a affinity for language. I definitely don't, but it's immersing yourself and trying and practicing that, that muscle gets stronger and you get better at it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a lot more of a thing. These mock interviews, practice interviews are much more of a thing these days. Like back for some reason, I don't know, we just pre-internet or whatever, we didn't do it as much, but these days there are actually you know, offerings online where you go and you pay and they'll do like, you know, they'll do some yeah. interviews. The other thing is, you know, it, there are question banks out there too. Like, so it doesn't have to be this like scary unknown of what are they going to ask me? It's like, well, no, here's, here's 20 people that did PM interviews. Here's a hundred people that did PM interviews at Facebook. Here's a question they got. Wow. Two or three of them actually recurred several times. So you don't get caught by surprise a little bit. And by the way, all the questions are out there for every company. I, I know. 90% of the questions are some version of something that's out there. So I wouldn't overthink Right. It. Right. Yeah, exactly. Cool. And then I, th I like that the thing you said about the pre-read really resonated with me too. And I would take a step back and say, I think there's a big difference between verbal communication and written communication and the introvert, extrovert manifests itself especially in verbal in the moment in a meeting to your point you might only have two or three people speaking up but um ver writing it's funny because i feel like when you write something down it's more polished and more rigorous and better thought out than when you than when you say it right it's more thoughtful um and the first place that i worked out of school everything was done by writing, like everything was done there. Of course, you'd talk to people and stuff, but you would document all the decisions in writing because people would make a recommendation. You have to say, I agree, subject to these comments. So it was very much in writing and you would actually have to get the other people to sign your decision document. And so they would have to read it. And if it didn't, wasn't clear or they didn't agree, it wouldn't work. And, and so there aren't that many places that are like that, but Amazon is known for that, right? They're known for their pre-reads. They don't, they know, they don't like PowerPoints. And it, maybe it's because of this, that in the very beginning of a meeting, everybody sits there around the table and reads the pre-read. It's like quiet, right? Yeah. I think have you, that, you know, have you heard of that? Yeah. So one of the things we do do is like, we do do written communication. We send out pre-reads. We've done kind of the six pager or three pager, six is a lot. Mm, right. And, you know, three pager know. kind of summarizing. And I think that that helps because it gives everyone a chance to process it. You know, you can circle on the page what your thoughts are. You can ask questions afterwards. And so it's a much more structured way of communicating. And it helps make sure that you're sussing out all of the open questions and opportunities to say, hey, this didn't sit well with me. Can you help me understand why you said X? Or have we thought about X risk? And seeing it in black and white is not just, did you hear it in the conversation? Did I miss it? You know, maybe they said it this way, but it meant something else. It just reduces the opportunity for miscommunication as well. Right, definitely, yeah. And I like the other thing is when you were talking about the idea of pulling it up on a sheet, right? Pulling up a Google sheet and having a column for everybody. It reminded me, one of my, um, one of the product leaders is very talented that I respect a lot. They came into this company and I was working with them and they brought in this practice of when we would be doing a product review, like someone would be, you know, we're, we're, you know, it's, it's gonna coming up to, you know, they're proposing what the design of this new feature is gonna be. We would have a review with the leadership and the feature team would come in and present it. And then we would go around to your point, we'd hit everybody in the room. It wouldn't just be who decided yeah. to open their mouth. It would be, we'd go around and it was structured feedback of what did you like? What didn't you like? And how can you make it better? Mm. And they just embraced that. And, and you got so, it was just, it was just, it just like became like autopilot. The Google sheet would come up <laughs> and we would do it. And so everybody just got the expectation of, hey, you're going to be asked for your input on these three questions every single time we have a major decision. And it also prevents the free rider problem because people who are shy or introverted might not feel comfortable speaking, but they put their input in the sheet and they can just read it out. 
And so making that part of the pre-work, not even doing it in the room, one of the things we do is we often do the, the pre-work is you read mm -hmm. this and then you put in your rating. Like you have to rank four things. Mm -hmm. like you have to give your feedback on X. Yes, no, maybe. And you have to put in your comments. Now people are doing this the night before. So suddenly you have visibility into how, like where where's the conversation going? How do I think about this? And then you can call on people. Hey, I noticed you said there was a huge risk here. Can you share more about that, Carol? You know, I noticed that, you know, you have, you, you flag that, you know, perhaps this is not going to go well internationally. Why is that, Carrie? And to really kind of, now you're seeing much more of the richness of the conversation, even if Carol and Carrie might not have brought that up in the room. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And then the one thing I'm thinking about too is, this was all happening before COVID and remote work. Yeah. And I'm just, I, I think with remote work, I definitely, I work with a lot of companies. I do a lot of meetings. I know there's some people just turning off the webcam and, you know, with their cozy socks on going, this is great. I can sit back and I don't have to do it. So do you have any advice for, uh, for, you know, people with the remote work situation, how to, how to one, for people that struggle with getting their voice heard and two, as people want to draw, get those people engaged, I guess. Yeah. Well, first, if you, you know, it's if, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, if you show up to a meeting and don't say anything, were you even there? You know, because you could have just read the notes, right? So one best practice is obviously like pre-reads, but then post notes, like notes of decisions and follow-ups. So if you're just free writing in every meeting, you should be actually investing your time on other things because you just listening to, to a meeting, like it's a webinar, you could just listen to that in your spare time. Like there, you know, you could just read the notes. And so instead, really be intentional. Like, what are you showing up to? Because we talk about there's too many meetings. It's it's not like a wedding, which is an honor to be invited. Like that's not how it works, right? Instead, really being choose choiceful and then being intentional when you do show up. What impression do you want to leave in this meeting? What does success in this meeting look like? If success in the meeting is I just heard all the content because I needed to hear it, not really success. You know, if you don't participate, was it worth it? And to really kind of audit your week, like just go a week and audit it. You have your meeting in your calendar, your Google calendar or Outlook, audit yourself, like write down the meetings and then say, did I participate? Did I get something out of this? Did I achieve what I wanted to achieve? You'll find that you're free riding on way more meetings than you think you are. And that you're actually not contributing as much as you can. I see, I see that for a lot of people, like people will show up to meetings and I say, well, why were you there if you weren't going to say anything? You know? And they're like, well, I just want to hear what's happening. And I said, really, is, is that useful? Because you could literally read the pre-read and the notes and pretty much in 20 minutes could get what, you know, an hour meeting discussion, you know, it's, it's summarized. But that does require companies actually have better meeting hygiene as well. Sending out pre-reads, sending out notes, having clear action items, having accountability for those things, and then saving everyone time. Because if you read the pre-read, you're like, I, my project has nothing to do with this. I don't need to come. Then you can opt out too. And I don't think we, we should actually feel bad about saying no to things like that. And so I do think that we should give ourselves permission to be kind to ourselves and not feel like we have to be there every single time. That's a good point. Yeah, because I definitely know people, could, well, pre-read is not, a, you don't see that commonly, I don't think, not, and we should see more of it, but we don't see a lot of it. So then I see people showing up to a meeting just in case they say something that impacts my pro project, right? And um, and they're just sitting there on the laptop with a little one ear, kind of like this. Going, doo, 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 what, what did you what, you mentioned my project? What, what you know, like, and it's just it's like defense. They're playing defense. Yeah. It's like it's like this def defense mechanism, yeah. defense yeah. mechanism. Like you don't have to send your whole XFN. Maybe just have one person listen in for you. Right. Like saving the other right. six people time, right? Like showing up to a meeting and yeah. just you know sending your canary to the coal mine, and then you know, the rest of you can actually do productive work. But I think we just have kind of this sense that it's like the fear of missing out, FOMO, is real. Right. It's like, oh, I missed that meeting. Something important might have happened. And I'm like, hmm. Or you can actually like get productive work done and actually have more impact. Right. Well, I think another big part of it, so you got the pre-read, you mentioned the post notes. I think that's pretty rare, a rare practice in a lot of places too, right? So again, it takes, it's unfortunate at a high level, a high percentage of the work happens in real time verbal communication, not in asymmetric written community, like eight, you know, like, you know, not at the same time, <laughs> you know, like whatever the right word is for that, right? Not at the same time, you know, so that a lot of those things, it just basically moves it to that and, and that allows it. But when, when, when the, the default work modality is 
hey, the discussions happen real time in Zoom or in person, then everyone feels like they have to participate in those, I guess. So, well, I think we just have to get better at asynchronous communication. Yeah. Like we're working with right. people across time zones. We are working with people in different locations who have different needs. And they just, not everyone can be. 100% present at every meeting all the time and, you know, ferret out exactly what's happening. And so I just think we, we've we kind of moved to this remote work, flexible work policy. And then we kind of go, well, we're not changing anything. And I'm like, what do you mean? We have massively changed our lives and yet we don't change any of our processes. We don't think about what good hygiene is. And so one of the things that we've been trying to implement is much more like have a day seat at the beginning of every, you know, at the opening of the meeting, have an agenda, have a pre-read in the meeting request, you know, send out notes afterwards. Just simple hygiene will save so much time because now people don't have to kind of be a sentinel and, and listen in for something that might touch their projects because now, you know, right, you can actually follow up and say, oh, you know, Hey Eddie, I noticed that um, you you talked about X in your meeting. I wasn't able to make it, but I just wanted to make sure that there was you know we weren't going to overlap because we're trying to ship on X day, you know. And and suddenly it's a lot easier than you spending an hour at his meeting about something that's really important to him, and it's like two minutes about your project. And we can do better because I think we can serve each other better. And to your point, Dan, about you know the whole we are we are so used to relying on verbal communication to get things done at the modern tech company, and that is the very biased thing because not everyone processes the same way. Not everyone feels comfortable. Not everyone can even make it to the rooms all the time. And suddenly now it's right. the people who physically show up. It's the people who speak the most. And suddenly the bias just, you know, compounds on itself. So instead, like your know, written communication is super important because now you have documentation too. Because I remember that we had this meeting with um with the CEO and Two team, our team was fighting with this other team, went to meet with the CEO, and it was an hour meeting. And then afterwards, we spent longer fighting over what was actually said at the meeting than we had the meeting because we couldn't even agree what was said. And so we actually invited another VP from the company to actually take notes live because we could not agree. I'm just saying wow. that was insane. But she took notes for us because she was an objective third party that was on neither one of our teams. And it was causing so much friction to even show up to these meetings because we can't even agree on what was said. That is wow. imperfect human communication. And I realized that after that, we realized how off we were because we were, you're filtering everything through your lens. No, he agreed with us. No, he agreed. You know, we couldn't even remember. Yeah. Like, how could you, how could, you know, 20 people sit in a meeting, 10 on each side and not agree on what happened? That happened. And we, we just had to change the way we did things. And so then from then on, we literally had live notes on the screen as we were presenting. Nice. And it forced us to actually agree on what was said. And it was, I mean, I hope we don't have to do that all the time, but it just, those meetings were so fraught and it cost so much time. Think about a post meeting to talk about the meeting. That was longer than the meeting itself. Right. I was like, right. okay guys, we are doing this all wrong. And part of it was that we just couldn't agree. And I realized that we take our own filter and put it on what was discussed. And there were no, there were no live documentation. And so of course, everyone kind of shaded it with what they hoped was the truth. And I don't think anyone was intentionally being duplicitous. I think they were just looking at the world from their perspective. And it was really hard. And we it took us a few times before we got that right. And suddenly it was much better actually everyone being there and having a neutral third party with us. And I, I can I, mean, I hear you. It doesn't sound silly because I've seen those contentious discussions. And um, and to your point, it, people are hearing, they're filtering, they're selectively hearing and saying, oh, I think that they're agreeing with me on this one. And, you know, because maybe the person's trying to walk a fine line between the two points of view or something. But um, but it's interesting because earlier today, actually, I, I, I hosted a, um, a webinar with Tony Olick. And it's a different context, but it's the same tool, which is when he interviews customers to do customer research, Instead of just taking notes here or taking notes later, he puts the notes right up there. So like while the customer is saying, it's like, oh, it sounds like this is a problem for you. And it's right there. And so that way there's a feedback loop. If he doesn't type it right, it's like, oh, no, actually it's this. And, and I'm remembering it's been a while, but a few meetings where we did like the action items. When I was the PM, I would put sometimes I'd put the action items right there. So everybody knew, OK, Charles, you're doing this. Sally, you're on the hook, right? So that's not that's a that's probably a good idea to make sure people leave the meeting on one you get the notes done real time instead of having a, yet another thing to do, and then everybody can see them and and make sure that they're aligned before the meeting's over. 
I love that. I think that that is a way to gain alignment because, you know, meetings, again, if without documentation, like, do you remember exactly what happened and who has what action item and afterwards arguing about what the action items are. The other thing, by the way, just you sparked something as, as you were talking, which was a lot of times we walk into the room and we, we have a presentation, right? But what we don't do is we actually gather the opinions of everybody in the room ahead of time documented. Because when you talk, and I remember um, somebody, there was another vice president at, at Facebook who did this. We were disagreeing about something that was like pretty contentious. And she made everyone actually write, either you had to write out what your opinion was, or you had to vote for someone else's opinion. And what we realized was like really subtle things around how we treat privacy, data usage, or you know whether or not people could opt out. We're like really small disagreements and if you couldn't agree with somebody completely, you had to write your own. And suddenly, mm. but they we thought there were three opinions, there were eight. And, and then of the people who voted, maybe 20 people would vote for those eight, but they were all very subtle. And so by documenting and actually seeing it, you saw, oh, you believe X, but you wanna do Y. Because you could believe the same thing, but wanna do different things, or you could wanna do the mm. same thing, but believe different things. And it was just, really yeah. illuminating to force everybody into pick one of these swim lanes or create your own. But if you agree with one of them, you get to vote for one of them. If you don't want one of these, you have to create your own. And then looking at them, you realize that the matrix was completely all over the place, that we thought there were three opinions, there were eight, and they were very subtle. But I think this is where documentation and communication is imperfect. Documentation matters a lot in these cases because the smallest change can make the product substantially different. Whether someone can opt out or not of X is like a substantially different product because you had to like support the opt out, then you had to like tell partners to use that data. And suddenly you're, you're creating a level of complexity. And so it actually created a forced alignment where everyone can now see. And if you pick, you know, when they escalated it, when people were picking, suddenly it was not what people thought they were picking amongst. Got it. Yeah. No. And I just one final point. This this verbal versus written is just I just to your, when you said, hey, we're modern tech companies still doing it. I, I will joke because I'll be with a client and someone be like, hey, I heard the VP say we're pivoting to do X in a meeting the other day. Yeah, I heard from Tom. It's like three hand. It's like, you know, like they weren't even there. I'm like, it's like we're cave people around a fire talking, you know, <laughs> tribal lore. I'm like, what? Like, and so now it's like, well, we're going to pause that project because I heard Tommy say that the VP said this. I'm like, really? Like, you know, so it, what, as I process it, I'm like, as a leader, you have to be especially careful about that, right? I feel like you just have to be really clear, try to put the key decisions in writing. Otherwise, that kind of stuff happens. And it just kind of it kills productivity because people are now they're left like, well, I heard this thing. I don't know. And I think that's part of the danger that we have, which is like, everyone walks away from the meeting. It's like, you know, you all had uh, saw an elephant in there, but you saw different parts of the elephant and it's still an elephant. But what you saw is very much colored by, oh, I, those two minutes when you said X, like that's the thing I'm taking away. Or someone else goes, oh, I, I thought they were canceling that because they said why. And it's like the second or third derivative of the thing that I was said. And the rumor mill then starts. And so one of the things is, uh, one of the things we did recently was we put together the list of things we're not going to do next year. And right. you know, companies should do that more often, not just say what we are going to do, but what we're not going to do, what we're postponing. And it was, it, it was a little jarring for people to see the list because, look, I had some things on there that I really wanted to get done. And, but at the same time, by actually saying out loud, these are the things we're going to postpone. The answer is not no, it's not now. It actually takes, you know, it takes courage to do that as a company because it's so easy to say, well, it's somewhere on the list in the backlog, you know, but the backlog is it's 2024 anyways. Why don't we just say it and stop having meetings about it? And I said, if anything on this list, you know, you have a meet, you're asked to have a meeting about, you're welcome to not go because this is off the table. And just think about if we just did that much more often. Like the things we're going to say not now to, a fast not now, a fast no is better than a really slow burn yes because you're working on 10 initiatives of which you know two are only going to get prioritized. I cannot agree more with what you say. So most of my documents that I do, we have a section for scope. We say what's in scope, what's out of scope. It's very empowering and it feels good when you say this is out of scope because then you don't have to de keep debating it and yes. debating it and debating it. You know, it's like, no, we're we're doing iOS first and Androids later. Just stop, stop it. Like we're not going to talk. And to your point, if no sounds too harsh, 
Not now, not, not for this planning milestone that we're talking yeah. about, right? So yeah, I, I, I think that's, and again, if it's in writing and then everybody knows that it's out of scope, then it empowers everybody to just not spend time on it. So I think that's awesome. That's awesome advice. Okay, let's switch. We have a lot of questions that have been building up while we've been talking. So let's do this. Let's get in here. Carol Greenbaum. Hi, Deb. Um, thank you for joining us. And question for you. I, I'm curious if you have implemented any specific changes in how you run calibration at Ancestry after what you've observed at all the various companies and um, specifically to moderate or mitigate communication bias. Well, I think not just in Ancestry, but I did work on this also at Facebook, is knowing bias is half the battle because so much of bias is just un unacknowledged and unknown. So affinity bias, you know, bias towards people who speak the first, you know, people, mm -hmm. for example, you know, the people who speak the most, you just have such more, a more affinity because you know them in some way. You feel like you know them in some way, even if you don't actually know them. And as, as somebody in senior leadership, what happens is you have such a large purview. Like you have like 800 people. So you don't know any individual person, but you're like, oh, that person presented. And that five minutes, I was really impressed. What's the totality of their actual work? Like that five minutes, they could be amazing, but they could be terrible. And if they were like the person Dan was talking about, it's very dangerous. And so really structuring the communication in calibrations is the most important thing. So really having like a structure mm -hmm. around how we're gonna talk about it, who's gonna talk, having the documentation written ahead of time, instead of having people riff on it. These were just really bias interrupters that I think every company has, has to do. And we do that with promotions, we do that with calibrations. And I think that is a really critical step because you read these, you read these um, articles about bias and the bias is really real because the affinity bias, the, you know, gender, there's gender bias, you know, women get different ratings and reviews and people of color. And, and as you read these things, you realize that so much is not intentional. It's just how we as humans are, are kind of programmed to, to react to each other. So the thing I would say for every company, and I think this is really important, is to really structure calibrations so that it's fair. So structure so everyone gets the same amount of time so that you don't have people bringing in random incidents that lasted five minutes from you know some meeting where somebody felt like they didn't have the answer and really kind of looking at the totality of someone's work. And yes, if there's feedback that this person, you know, is, doesn't know their stuff, that's important. If somebody didn't, couldn't answer something in five minutes, that's not, that's irrelevant. So really calling that out as well. So I think that that changes the way these conversations happen. Do you set those rules ahead of time? Yeah, so one of the things that's important is actually setting groundwork. So, you know, a lot of times people kind of wing calibrations. Instead, there should be like clear ground rules, like three minutes per person. You know, you put them in the, the bucket. You And I think the more structured the rubric is, the better the calibration ends up because you don't end up kind of randomly people riffing. I actually think the biggest challenge is not necessarily just the calibration, but it's how prepared the manager is. Because mm -hmm. if your manager is super prepared and does the work, it is completely different than if your manager wings it and, and everyone else can tell. But it has nothing to do with you and the quality you are as a, as a leader or a PM or a designer, but your manager actually not preparing is like a huge bias, by the way, mm -hmm. in, in the process that you can't have any control over. And so that's why I think setting these rules up front and sending them out ahead of time forces the managers to do a lot of the work ahead of time so that they can't wing it. Like if you need a written statement and they didn't put anything in there, everybody knows it's actually the manager's responsibility, not yours. Perfect, thank you. All right. Thanks for that, Carol. All right. Next up, Hamid. Excellent. Let me get you in here. Hi, this is Sumaya. My husband, Hi. Hamid, is also joining. <laughs> and I okay. think two for it. one. Two for one. So I have uh, two questions. One was, I'm not an introvert, but I do have a lot of these problems. So thank you so much for this amazing conversation. So what if I work with an introvert like manager? This has happened to me. And I see that they don't, um, sometimes they don't do a good job like advocating for like their directs or me, for example. And um, they kind of like let others be in some conversations or in their calibrations, they kind of give up and um, don't really fight. So how, what can we do to, to train them and uh, because, like for, for my experience, they're really good managers otherwise. Mm. So, yeah. 
That's really hard. I mean, as I said to Carol, like so much of your success is dependent on your manager advocating for you. One idea is, have you talked to your manager about what are ways that I can help you amplify this work? You know, okay. are there ways that I can, you know, because what, what happens is there are some people, it's very easy in calibration to get them an exceeds rating because everyone knows them. And it's so much easier as a manager not to burn chips on, you know, every single person, but to say, wow, that person's obviously great. But a lot of it is what work you can put into, which is ask your manager, hey, you know, here's what I'd like to accomplish. What can I do to make it easier for you to make the case for my promotion or a good rating? And suddenly it becomes a partnership as opposed to them just feeling like they're disappointing you. Create a partnership. You know, say you have something vested, they have something vested, and together you're actually partnering on that. I think it feels less fraught for managers in that way as well. The other thing is like, hey, you know, what was the feedback from other, other managers? How could I, you know, how could I connect with them? And if they say, well, this team had questions around your product, then you say, would it be okay if I just, you know, one thing I'd like to do is meet with that team and kind of share a little bit more about our work at their next brown bag. And suddenly you are now doing work with them alongside them and they don't feel like they're carrying alone because especially a manager who feels very uncomfortable advocating, they feel like, well, it's easier to give in to, than to kind of fight every single fight. And I just pick one or two people to fight for as opposed to across the team and to make it easy on them. You know, not every manager is a fighter, but you see the fighter managers, you know, I've seen some fighter managers like really work hard and fight and exhaust the system to get what they want for their team. And others are like, yeah, you know, at this point, this is where I draw the line. And look, not every manager should be fighting because you can only imagine what calibrations will look like. But instead, I think it's important to make it easy, as easy as possible for them. Right, right. That's, that's great advice. Thank you so much. I also have one more question. Um, so this has happened to me, like somebody asked me a question and then I couldn't answer right away. And then after that, I could feel like that person never really counted on me because I was doing the project, but suddenly I kind of couldn't answer. Is there a way to uh, recover from such situations? Yeah, one thing I've seen people do is, you know, after if you if you're asked a question and you don't know the answer, say, you know, I don't know, but I'll look into it. I'll get back to you within 24 hours. And so now you've put the action item on yourself. They're expecting to hear from you, and you will have a very thoughtful and and you know generous and, and well thought out answer that you're going to share with them, and share it not just with them but with the group so other people see that you close the loop. I think that's really important because sometimes you just leave it hanging. Like people say, well, I don't know. I'll look into it. And they never respond to me. And I'm like, oh, does that person not care? Did, you know, is that, did they just not hear what I asked? Did they not, you know? And so instead actually following up and showing the follow through is something really powerful. But in the moment, if you don't know, say, I don't know the answer to that, but I can get that for you. Let me talk to someone. And suddenly you're on the other side of that. You're actually able to turn the opinion around to a positive thing. Cause now you have a much more time to create I craft a thoughtful answer. Here's one slide or one page on the question you asked. Here's what we thought through. And here, you know, I hope this is useful for to answer your question. And suddenly now you've given them a gift as opposed to you feel like you're in a deficit. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Okay, great. Thanks, Hamid, for that. And then uh, Phil, Phil Levinson is up next. <laughs> here at my daughter's soccer practice, but I'm not too introverted, so I didn't want to be shy about jumping in. Thank you, Deb. This is great. Great to connect. Here was the question. If for managers managing folks that are facing different communication constraints or challenges or aren't just introverted, what are some other clever, maybe non-obvious tactics that have worked, especially when you're managing, let's say, director level folks that for which communication is part of their role and influencing others across the organization is so important. Have you seen any other practices that have worked well for you or others that you would recommend? Yeah, so, you know, I'll give you an example, a recent example. I, my general counsel is this incredible leader, and but he kind of always stuck to the legal side, right? He kind of said, this is my lane. And I said, actually, I want you to do more. And he just couldn't, I said, you know, why don't you propose something? He didn't really propose anything. And I said, how about you take over a couple initiatives? And I gave him a couple assignments. And suddenly he had to influence other people to get the answers. So I gave him one thing was, uh, we call it the fresh look list, which is things that we have made decisions about in the past and we had shut down or we said no to that we're going to relook at. 
you know, um, and so suddenly he has to go out there and talk to 10 people about, you know, because people would contribute stuff to the list, but he had to compile it and he shared it, you know, more broadly. And suddenly I'm putting him in the driver's seat by making him the executive accountable for it. And he's really grown during that process. He talked to a bunch of people. He presented it to the senior leadership team. He shared it with the company. And suddenly he's in a different spot. He's not the legal guy. He is the person in charge of the, the executive sponsor of the fresh look list. I did the same thing when we had a couple really key postmortems. And I said, look, why don't you lead the postmortem process? And he said, oh, that's great. He created a template. He got everyone engaged. He, he led that conversation. And normally, you know, a general counsel could do this. They could not. I could have asked anybody to do this. But by asking him and giving him assignment, he's like, oh, I have something to do. And suddenly he's blossomed so much and just seeing him grow. But part of that was just giving him a thing that he felt like he could own on behalf of the company that was outside of his legal lane. And I think things like this, where you, you're giving somebody a, a company level initiative where they see visibility across the company, they have to influence or fail at this project, your executives do not want to fail. They do not want to disappoint you. And so suddenly you're putting them in a different perspective, in a different seat, and now they're doing different things and exercising new muscles. That's great. I really like that. That's a great recommendation. And I also like the sort of walk before you run approach, maybe provide one project that's doable, maybe a little challenging, but doable. And that's as a way to build confidence. Thank you. And also, uh, thanks, Dan. This has been a great discussion. Really, you've enjoyed this. So thanks to you both. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Phil, for your question. Appreciate it. All right. Next up, we have Cindy Ha. Awesome. Thank you. And, and thank you, Deb, so much for opening up this discussion for us. Um, so just a little bit of context. I'm a product designer and I work with PMs and my own manager. And a lot of times I use them as kind of like my shield, like a really good shield in some ways. So like I communicate my ideas and things with them. And then they kind of like just go out and do the communication for me. And um, I'm just realizing that this isn't a great place to be at for me, like in terms of growing my own career. And I just have a question around like, how do you work with your own manager to kind of uh, be more confident in this space and um, kind of advocate, not just advocate for you, but also like help you um, give you the word I'm looking for it is like a, give you like guidance on how to speak up more in meetings. Well, so I think one of the challenges we have is when things are ambiguous, a lot of people just don't pick up pick up the ball, right? You feel like you need to speak up more, but like do more of X doesn't always help. You like, eat more healthy. Well, sure, work out more, but instead, actually setting really actionable goals with your manager. This <laughs> half I'd like to accomplish X. I want you to rate me on this, and suddenly you have skin in the game, right? You're like, wow, I'm going to get rated on this. You know, it's like when I went to business school and they were going to give me a grade, and I have never gotten bad grades. So I do not want to get a terrible grade. I have to figure this out. And so by actually assigning yourself something, you're giving yourself permission to say, you know what, I'm not going to do the thing I was doing before. I'm going to try something different. And so tell your manager, you know, I would like to find my voice. This is what that looks like this half. I would like to sign up to do X. It's going to be scary. It's hard. But suddenly, once you give yourself the assignment, you're also giving, you're, you're taking away the free pass of like, well, I'm just going to passively give my ideas to my PM and they're going to communicate it. Suddenly you have to figure out how to communicate this in the meeting. You know, so one of the things I did with, um, with an engineering director on my team was he just never spoke. He was very vocal privately, one-on-one, -on -one, super smart, never spoke. And then I would, I made him actually, I actually said in every half hour meeting, you need to say one thing. And in every hour meeting, you need to say two things. And he was Really, um, I think he was frozen for the first couple of meetings, but he got better and better at it. And then he went to become um, the head of engineering for a big a gaming company. And suddenly he's like a different person. And I asked him, he's actually going to write a guest blog in January for me. And, and, he, and I said, what changed? Like, I coached you forever. And he's like, I just needed a different environment. Mm -hmm. And so we had worked at it for so long. And so, you know, the problem is that you're kind of in a rut, right? You're used to giving your ideas through other people. And so it's hard to change that. But if I put you in a new team and I said, in order to succeed in this new team, you have to show up. And this is, you know, you're suddenly not giving your permission to say, well, I'm just passing my ideas. At least the ideas are heard by people. And so you have to just like reboot yourself, right? Reboot mm -hmm. your old patterns. And for him, it was going to another company. But for you, maybe it's just, 
you know, rebooting yourself and saying, hey, here's what I need to do from here to where I want to go. And here's the steps I want to take and break it down that way. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's almost like I need like a fresh start, but also like vocalize that with my manager. So he's on board with it too. Accountability matters a lot. If your bonus is dependent on you doing something, suddenly it feels like you have to do it. If you're great, mm -hmm. if you're rating, if your manager's holding you accountable, suddenly you realize that you, you can't have the free pass, but it's like coming yourself in. You know, they said the best way to uh, lose weight was to you, you write a check to a charity that you hate. <laughs> and, you know, it's, and and then suddenly they say the best way to get yourself to work out or to lose weight is actually to, to two people were challenging each other. These are professors in, in behavioral economics or something. They actually wrote checks to like things that they loathe and they're like, I'll write a check to them. And if I don't exercise every day or I don't lose weight, I'm going to have, and suddenly they're so much more motivated than donating money to say, you know, a charity they care about. And so some, sometimes actually just forcing yourself to hem yourself in is what you need to kind of get yourself out of a rut. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. All right, Cindy, thanks for your question there. I appreciate it. And it sounds like basically, yeah, like just it, people, when they've been in a job for a while, they have, they've gotten used to the expectations that have been put there. So like you, sounds like you pushed your general counsel out of, out of their comfort zone, which was good. And, and that, that engineering leader just needed a new context. It sounds like so. All right. Next up, Tammy Cohn. Let's get you on here, Tammy. Hey everyone, hey Deb, thank you so much for the great advice and insights. Um, sorry for my voice, I've been under the weather. Um, I have a, a question. So, you know, as a product manager, communication is is key, right? It's a skill that, you know, that you need to improve constantly. You know, I see it as an art, right? To constantly, it's something you need to master. And as a non-native English speaker, you know, one of the things that helped me the most, like you mentioned, is a lot of preparation, right? Come prepared. But in many cases, when I need to, you know, communicate, um, you know, on the spot or like especially in interviews, this thing is something that I, you know, I, I find very challenging, um, especially when, you know, communication needs to be more concise and coherent. So do you have any advice uh, or how to improve on tricks, you know, things that, that um, you, know, you can share? Thank you. You know, one of the things that, so I'm extremely introverted. And one of the things that's helped me is I did impromptu speaking in high school. My kids actually do impromptu and extemp extemporaneous speaking. And that trains you to speak on the spot about things that you don't know about. And I feel like we don't practice that enough as a skill. I, you know, I never spoke outside of speech and debate, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't like I was like using this. But I actually find that if you practice this, like forcing yourself to do it, a little bit at a time, especially in safe spaces. So for example, one thing I encourage a lot of people to do is like a coaching circle, a lean in circle, you know, something like that, where it's safe to talk about something with a group of people you trust. And it's the same group of people. And suddenly, you know, they'll ask you advice and put you on the spot, but you're in a safe circle. And I think as you expand that circle to more, you know, more kind of open forums, I think you're just going to feel more comfortable over time. And so finding ways to actually practice in the safe space and then expanding to a little bit more fraud and a little bit more, and you may be talking to your team and then eventually working your way up to a company all hands, you know, but I think setting milestones and goals, like if you said, if I said to you, you need to ship this product, you don't go, okay, well, I'm going to ship it in April. You go, okay, I'm gonna break it down, right? How do I do that? Who do I need to involve? What are the things I need to do? Just like you, you know, project, pro product manage your communication, like you product manage your product. You think very deeply about what is a launch message? What do I want people to think? How do I wanna do this? Have you thought about that for your own communication? Like if I wanna achieve X, what do I need to do? How do I break down this problem? I think once you break it down, you're gonna see so much more rich output. All right, thank you. Thanks. Feel better soon. Yeah, and I would just add, um, you mentioned improv, basically, right? So I, uh, I, I randomly got into doing improv in college, and it was super helpful. And then, you know, one thing that you said to encourage other people was the whole yes and concept, right? So when someone's speaking, instead of not saying anything after they speak, just giving them some positive encouragement or reinforcement. But I've also known people, some PMs or other people in that I've worked with, they wanted to get better at this they've actually joined Toastmasters. Yes. And I've seen a lot of people that are kind of introverts. They, they're not comfortable public speaking. And it's just like a low pressure uh, outside of work setting where I've seen people just like make major strides and progress on that. So just another yeah. suggestion for people. 
What's really interesting is my son is extremely quiet and extremely shy, but he, he turns on when he does impromptu and extent. He's like a different person. You would just not recognize him. And I realized that it's because he's taking on a different persona and that's how he's able to communicate. He's 16 years in, in high school. And that if that's what you need, like, you know, he, he, when he was a kid, he was like maybe six years old. He did this as well. Like he would never say anything. And then he would turn on what he called reporter Jonathan. And he's like, I'm reporting from the front lines, you know, and then suddenly he was like a different right. person. And for him, it was just inhabiting someone else that that gave him the comfort. And I learned so much from that experience, which is, you know, you fake it until you make it. For him, it was just like, I'm pretending to be a character. And eventually now he's able to, to come out of his shell a lot more. And I think the same thing of, of each of you is, is if you feel uncomfortable, like inhabit, like what would someone who's extroverted do this, in this situation? What would somebody who's comfortable speaking do in the situation? And try to force yourself to inhabit a different person. And sometimes it gives you permission to kind of break that, you know, what we're talking about, Cindy, is like the other person is the one who went to the other company. Well, what did the new Cindy, what does the new Cindy do today? That, that the old Cindy didn't do. And suddenly you're a different person and slowly over time, you'll start living that. Yeah, that's great. And then, yeah, somebody said plus 100 of Toastmasters yeah. in, the, in the chat. And, you know, there's a lot of improv, there's a lot of business and improv. You see this intersection, these classes you can take, books you can read, things like that. So uh, I would encourage that for people too. All right, next up we have Greg. Thanks so much for the talk. It's been really helpful. Sure. Um, so I struggle with interviews. I prep a lot before them. And then when I go to the interview, I kind of go blank or I freeze. Um, I know that you already covered this a little bit, but I was wondering if you had any other tips. Well, the other thing is actually telling your interviewer, like inoculate them. Say, hey, you know, I've in the past when I've interviewed, like tell the recruiter ahead of time to, to tell the interviewers, because I think it's really important. I remember there was this one woman who interviewed with me and she, her answers were objectively really good, but she looked at the table the entire time. And it was because she was extremely, like, she just did not make any eye contact. And, and I just, I was having a really hard time connecting with her because she was literally talking at the table in front of me. And I, I pointed out to her and I said, Hey, you know, I know your comfort level with making eye contact is not great. Your answers were objectively good, but this is going to be difficult for the next interviewers. And I gave a heads up to some of her future interviewers just to let them know, you know, because inoculating them and giving them a, a heads up because your objective work is not an interview. And the problem is we interview as if that is actually the job when it's not, it's like 10% of your job is like showing up and answering random questions about things. That is so much not the job, right? The job is actually understanding customer needs, you know, designing products that make sense and, you know, shipping products and launching them and, and project management and thinking through corner cases. That's not what an interview is. And so a lot of re recruiters will be actually great allies. If you just say, hey, I really have a discomfort with, you know, X, I, you know, it's, and ask for accommodation if that's what you need. And, and I think that a lot of people, a lot more people would be more generous. Um, if you know people at the company, ask like, is this okay? You know, because I do think that you kind of giving a little bit of inoculation, a vaccine against kind of you freezing, say, or just tell the interviewer, sometimes I'll freeze. I just want to let you know ahead of time. And I just want you to know it's not because I'm contemplating your question, so I might take a little longer. And I've had people do that. And I appreciate people not trying to BS their way through because then I'm wondering like, why are they, like they're kind of, you know, not really answering me. I'm not really understanding. So be upfront. And I think you'll find that people are way more generous than you think they are. Yeah, I totally agree. I, uh, interviewing, I feel like you have to be like perfect or you put that in your mindset. Yes. So if you just let people know that you're human too, that yeah. makes it much easier. And I think you actually saying, Hey, you know, I want this job. I love this company and I really care about this. And I want to do well, but I really, you know, one thing I just like, want to let you know is sometimes I freeze if you ask a question. So can I take 30 seconds after you ask the question to think about your, the answer before I start? If you just start like that, then people go, oh, he needs this. This is totally fine. Like how often in your job is this a problem? Like not at all. And so I think you'll find most people are way more open. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And good luck on your next interview. Oh, thank you. All right, Greg, thanks for your question. And I would just reiterate <clears throat> what Deb said earlier about, you know, when somebody asks you a question, I think it's perfectly fine to say, hey, let me just take a few seconds to gather my thoughts before I answer. I think, and if you did that for like 
almost every question I personally wouldn't, I wouldn't feel, I'd, I'd be like, okay, they're being thoughtful about it. So, you know, that's a way. And yeah, there's a more subtle way too, where you can just try to buy yourself some time or, you know, just, I don't know. You can try to gather your thoughts, take a sip of water. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, whatever. But, work, so. Yeah. You know, so yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Okay, cool. Next up. Yeah. Thank you. Ernie Ting. Hi, Deb. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. I, I really appreciate it. It's a, a topic of great personal as well as professional significance to me. I, I'm um, Asian. And uh, so, I mean, one of the things is just the cultural norm coming from a norm where being quiet is uh, in many contexts more valued and, and you're not supposed to be talking and certainly not uh, making yourself known uh, if you don't have anything really uh, earth shaking to say. Um, so I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to to try to uh, ask you about a little bit broader question. I mean, I, I see this as uh, not only about people's individual success and, but you know, in terms of all of our efforts at trying to promote inclusion and diversity, how not only how individuals are successful, but how organizations can recruit people like that, keep them, uh, have them be successful and, and make progress on that. And I was thinking about, you talked about sort of personality, um, different kinds of personalities. I, I just alluded to, and I think you did too, actually about uh, cultural background. Um, there's factors around gender. Um, is There's things even like uh, sort of your, your, your educational background, you know? Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, like uh, a few of us went to a certain business school, but, you know, I mean, like, you know, okay, well, you're in the club, you can, like, in a, in a social setting, uh, which is perhaps just as important as a formal meeting, you know, certain people get to hang out together, other people are kind of on the fringes, um, and then even uh, rank, you know, as you, I think, or somebody else alluded to, you know, if somebody's a, a uh, VP or director, as opposed to somebody who's on the lower level in terms of who gets to talk and be included. So uh, I was wondering how you think about that sort of combination, constellation of, of factors that influence how people uh, can be successful and how the organization can accommodate them. Well, I think the biggest challenge is that we have this like fixed idea of what success looks like, right? Like we, in a lot of organizations, the people reach the top. If you look at the CEOs or people on boards, they all look at certain, like, you know, just, just, it's just, just how, like, if so, if I asked you to describe what a CEO looks like, like, what would you describe? You know, vast majority of CEOs are men. So of course you would say male and, you know, and as you break it down, you're like, there it's old, there's persons older, like, and you would just suddenly have all these embedded assumptions. And when you break those assumptions, it's really like there's a price to be paid because people don't think, oh, this person is naturally a leader. And so one of the things I encourage is to say, but we're what you think about missing out on all of this human capital and talent because we don't make it possible for people who are processors or quiet or who stutter. You know, our president is a stutter. And, you know, think about how debilitating that is for him to orate. He still struggles with it to this day. And, and so I do think, you know, people are different and have different challenges. And if we say, well, you know, you have to do it this way, you have to be able to process and interview questions, answer interview questions on a dime and you can't take time to process. Think about all the people you've screened out who are amazing talent that your company should be hiring. And so I do think companies are now coming around to say, hey, you know, this is this is one of the things that we want to do is actually open up the aperture to more people with different backgrounds. I still think that the interview process is very much imperfect, though. And the interview process has a lot of bias built into it. It's like, oh, if you, you know, there's a lot of affinity bias. If you went to the same school, you're more likely to say you should hire somebody. If you look like them, if you have X things in common, this is why people put a lot of stuff in the hobbies area. Cause they're like, I hope you really like skiing because then we could talk about something, right? Cause you know, so people will put like a number of hiking, skiing, like a bunch of things, but part of it is they want to connect over something whether it's the school you went to or some affinity that you have or affiliation. And so part of that is human connection is what people are craving. And one of the things that people bias towards then is people who speak to them, right? Because that's a different type of human connection. And so I do think what you're talking about, people from collectivistic societies feel less comfortable speaking up because you're taught 
keep your head down, do the work, right? My parents always told me that, you know, don't, you know, don't raise a fuss, don't ask for more, you know, because that's like how they were taught as well. And so it does take time to program that, right? Don't ask for too much. Don't, you know, don't, don't complain. And it's hard. And I, I think that it's something we all need to struggle with, but we should also be more accepting of people who are different from us as well. And so we do have a lot of work to do. I hope that as we're evolving as a workplace, we're going to get better and better at this. It's much better than it was 20 years ago, better than it was, you know, 40 years ago. And I think in 20 years, it'll be better as well. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ernie. Appreciate it. And yeah, I would just, I mean, I, we started off by talking about introvert versus extrovert. And like I said, for me, it was very eye-opening when I learned about that early in my career at work. I was very grateful at work that we did it in a work context. There's a personal context too, but there's a work context. And it just helped us have a vocabulary for talking about things and why this behavior is annoying you and you suddenly could demystify it. So I would encourage people, you know, uh, there's a lot of books out there on like personality theory at work and you can, you know, it has advice for introverts, has advice for extroverts, how to appreciate the other people, how to get the most from those other people that are, that have a different personality than you do. So, all right. Next up is Carrie. Hello. Welcome. So my questions are, I feel like it fits quite well in with um, Ernie's just now. And, and I was curious if there's you know, any specific tactics that you found you know, most effective in supporting and respecting these cultural differences. Um, I do have the opportunity to work with a lot of folks in different geos. And you know, there are definitely strong differences um, in how we communicate and like what our standards are of communication and communication bias. and you know, how I relate to folks I have a personal relationship with to encourage communication and chat is very different than folks that maybe we don't get to meet every day. Um, so I don't know if you have any tactics you found and sort of the global stage of how do I, you know, respect the fact that you are not, you know, primarily American, right? We're kind of rambunctious and gregarious. And um, if you have any, any tactics that you found help with that side. Um, I think the biggest thing is, you know, call it out. I think sometimes there's this kind of, um, we we live with this thing I call strategic ambiguity. We don't want to face things that are uncomfortable. And so we just kind of pretend it doesn't exist. But actually calling out, like actually having a session and saying, here's, you know, I want to learn about the cultural style of where you work. And I'd like for you to learn about the cultural style, especially in an American company. People expect American Americans believe that we're the center of the universe. And I I, you know, because you're just born like, oh yeah, this is the richest country in the world and we have all these opportunities and, and we're taught so much that, you know, we are the center of the universe. That's why when, when they say Americans travel abroad, we are really rude and that's partially true. And so part of it is like, you know, actually calling it out and saying, hey, look, the American style of leadership is not what it looks like everywhere. Let's have a conversation around these cultural differences. And by calling it out, you're now kind of, you know, unveiling and actually showing what's underneath the covers, which is, you know, they might not, you know, somebody in a different culture, especially a collectivistic culture, there's some cultures I've worked with are extremely hierarchical. You know, I walked into one meeting and like the most senior person sat in the middle and then surrounded by each person like this, you know, in a, in an arrow and the most junior people sat on the outside. And I was just completely flabbergasted because I was, we just sit anywhere. Right. And I found out when I traveled to Japan that you were supposed to sit as the guest with your, you're facing the door. And I sat on the wrong side and they're like, you can't sit on that side. And so there's these cultural norms that seem so obvious in Japan and so unobvious to me as an American. And, and I said, well, why would I not be able to sit on the side? And they said, you know, if someone breaches the door, it's only polite that the guest is not, is on the other side. And I was like, oh, I, <laughs> okay. Um, but you learn so much. And, and by, you know, learning, you learning a different culture, you're also able to adapt and support people who might not understand the American style, but actually calling it out and saying, I'm feeling this friction. Let's talk about it. I think sometimes we just kind of accept that, well, they'll figure it out. But actually, I think other people appreciate them being able to share. You know, one thing I, I heard about was um, when uh, there's one company that said, whenever a new person joins their company or a new team joins their, their company, like they acquire someone, they actually give an opportunity for that team to teach them something. So they do a brown bag lunch and everyone asks questions to the team or the individual and says, what can we, what can we learn from you? 
So rather than saying, well, Americans, we do it this way, we're going to train you to be American, actually say, well, what can we learn from you? Can you share more about your cultural, your cultural norms and you know, how, you, how you like to lead? And ask them questions and be curious. I think that you know, often it's easy to be critical because like, you don't do things our way. But actually being curious rather than critical is so important. Thank you. Great, thanks. And the you know, last couple of questions touched on cultural differences, which can definitely play on this. I want to recommend a book, The Culture Map. There's a book called The Culture Map. I only know about it from one of our other speakers, uh, Christina Woodkey. And it talks about like, it kind of maps different cultures on level of hierarchy, right? Or, you know, how open the communication is versus close. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do it justice, but I just put it, I just put a link to it in the chat for people. It's called The Culture Map. And so maybe that would provide some good info for some people. So, okay. I think we're at our last question. Thanks everyone for the great questions here. Okay. So Niha, welcome. Thanks, Deb. It was uh, a very interesting talk. So uh, for me, I am a mid career, I would say a product manager. And what I've observed is with myself and other sort of junior coworkers as well, that it's very easy to get into the mode of contributing, participating when you have a very task based group. Uh, mm -hmm because it's it's all about what you need to get done and it's very specific. But when you're put into situations where you're in a meeting room with execs or maybe even skip level managers, it just becomes like a pin drop kind of a situation. Uh, so maybe it'll help me to understand if there are any sort of tips, tricks or ways to sort of jump through that valley <laughs> of being able to somehow belong in that sort of exec room and be able to contribute in those discussions. Thank you. Well, one thing I think a lot of people can, when you're moving from IC to manager and then frontline manager to manager of managers or running a larger and larger org, is what they're looking for is somebody who can elevate the conversation. So when you're an IC, you know everything, all the details, what the API calls. Like I remember the original API calls between PayPal and eBay because they were set up a certain way and we had, you know, and I, we had a very specific way of like our APIs talking to each other. And I was the PM for that, right? So I still remember some of those details. And so, but your job is not to explain how the APIs work. Your job is to say, how do these companies work together? So then suddenly you're kind of elevating and beyond it's like, how do we improve our processes so that we can talk to each other better and so on and so forth. And, and as you grow in your organization, you're expected to go you know, 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet and explain context across a broad area. And so if you go too deep, they're like, oh, she's too detail oriented. She can't see the forest for the trees. But a great product manager early on is somebody who's like in every detail, understands every part of the spec, every error message. And so what trains you to be good at certain places doesn't take you to the next level. And so mm -hmm. what you need to do is constantly re-elevate yourself and say, okay, you know, this was useful at this point. Now I need to step up one level and two levels. And as you talk to people who are further and further away, you know, a lot of the executives don't even understand how the API calls work. They just want to know, is this going to work? And are we going to be able to take payments, right? And so suddenly you're actually now elevating again, right? You don't need to know how the details work or how the, we do the handshake or, you know, things like that. When we were doing the batch job, like how the FTP works, that's not important. What's important is can we actually take payments and can we actually drive the business forward? And so suddenly you have to lift yourself up. And so one thing I, I tell people is often whatever level, like if the person is one level above you, you need to take it up a level. If they're like four levels, you take it up four levels. And so really kind of tuning your communication altitude. And I call this an altitude problem because you need to speak to people at their altitude. And so I'm writing a post about that, like how to manage your communication altitude. Because I think sometimes if you get too detailed, they're just lost and they don't, they're like, oh, well, she knows her stuff, but she can't, you know, she can't sit in a room with these other, you know, more senior people. If you're like, if you go to high level and you're actually talking to your engineering manager, they're going to go, well, she doesn't know the details, right? And so suddenly it's really kind of being able to play high and low at different points and being able to manage your altitude. It sounds like where you are, you're kind of in between, right? You're actually kind of elevating to do executive reviews. At the same time, you have to be able to understand what's happening on your team. And so this is the part where a lot of people struggle because you, you know all the details and you have to communicate upward. And this is where a lot of mistakes happen. One of the things I actually found very useful was when I was doing executive reviews was I'd actually trade our presentation. So we used to all do the executive reviews on like every half. I would trade presentations with other leaders of my same level. So other VPs or other senior directors or directors, like I would send it to them and they would send me theirs. 
And what seems really obvious to you is so unobvious to someone who doesn't work on your product. Cause they're like, well, what does this acronym mean? One person sent me um, the review for search and I said, this doesn't make any sense. Like, is it better or worse? Because I feel a lot of ambivalence on your, your deck. It's like, are you doing better now that you've taken over the team or is it worse? Like, I really can't tell. And what he said was really brilliant, but not in the deck. He said, it's objectively by the metrics, it is not better, but it feels a lot better. And people feel like it's made progress. And I said, that's not what you said. And so he went back and redid the entire presentation and it went really well. But a part of it was that I had the objectivity of like not actually working in that area to tell him that feedback. And, you know, that's really helpful. If you have peers that you trust, show them the presentation. I often get my, my um, executives to actually share presentations with each other and say, what do you think this is trying to say? Mm-hmm. And suddenly someone with an outside perspective will give you so much more information because your team knows exactly what you know. You are like a mind melt, right? You're a collective. But someone else who's like in your same position, who's in the same level can say, oh, I don't understand these acronyms. And honestly, I don't, I don't really understand how the customer problem that you're describing is solved by your solution. And suddenly you're like, oh, I'm missing something. So I would encourage you to do that. I found that really, really powerful. Cool. Thanks. That's super helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And um, I can't help but So now this last question got into another key facet of Myers-Briggs. I have a slide. I just got to share real quick. Okay. okay. It's, it's, it's S versus N, sensing versus intuiting. Yes. Yes. Can you all, can you all see this? So this is basically, this is the thing. And, and, and it comes in with communication. But to your point, I want to yes and what Deb said. When you're a junior PM, you're in the details, you're in the weeds. And as you move up, you cannot stay in the weeds. You have to summarize things. So I like what you said for every level up, you got to zoom up. And I view it as an altitude thing too, right? People say, what's a 30,000 foot view? What's the big picture, right? Those kind of things. And this, this gets kind of an S versus N. So again, it's a work thing that you'll learn. And I actually, when I interview PMs, this is the secret I call this dynamic range. Where are you comfortable? Are you only a big picture person? Are you only a detail person? Or can you span, right? And I think the strongest PMs and the best kind of CEOs and leaders, they can connect the dots here and they can span. They can zoom down when they need to. They can zoom up when they need to. So I just had to, I feel very strong. This is for me, this is like, at the end of the day, when we we would interview all these smart PM candidates, the two differentiators would be passion for our product and company, which has nothing to do with your skills. And this, at those at the end of the day, would be the biggest differentiators that I've found. So anyway, again, just a plug for learning about some personality theory, because I, le- I learned all that back then, too. So, all right, cool. I don't know. Any thoughts on that, Deb? Well, that- no, I mean, I, I do think the best leaders are the ones who have that ability to, like, go deep with their team and then go broad. And, like, really playing high and low at different points, the flexibility of doing that is just a skill set that will really benefit you in the long term. And so knowing kind of where your communication has to land and because, you know, your engineers want the details, like your designers want to understand like the most detailed thing and how it's going to work. But your your the executives don't care. They care about whether or not this is going to accomplish the company goals. And if you just speak, say the wrong thing to the wrong group, it's really about matching, right? You're matching their expectations. And so I also think the biggest thing I tell people is don't don't think about what you're going to say. Think about what message you're trying to land into whom. Because it's about what they hear, not what you say. And too often we focus on what we're saying is like, is this completely accurate? Instead, what is going to, what message are you trying to land? And does th- what you're saying actually land the message to help drive understanding, alignment, incentives, resources, whatever it is you're trying to achieve, and then work backwards from there. I think too often we get in our own heads, like this slide has to say the exact data that's like, I mean, do not manipulate the data, but really kind of helping people understand how that data leads you to your conclusion at the level at which it's going to help them get the message. That's the most important thing. Yeah. And I think more broadly as a PM, you work cross-functionally, right? You talk to devs, you talk to designers, you talk to execs, you talk to marketing, you talk to sales. You can't talk to them all the same way. You have to, t- you have to be, it's just like customer empathy. You have to be emp- empathetic to the audience. And I think the last point you're bringing up is, Hey, the more senior your audience the less they care about the details. I remember when I was pretty young in my career, before I even got in PM, I went into my big senior exec's office to share my recommendation. And I, I gave a big, like like a five minute spiel about what it was. And he goes, oh, so it sounds like a trade-off between strength and weight. 
And I was like, my mind was like, I'm like, oh my God. It's like the 30,000 with you. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I just did this whole five detailed thing with all these options. And I'm like, wow, he's got such a big picture view of that. So um, cool. All right. Well, Deb, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, this has been a great discussion. Appreciate it. Thanks for the conversation. Um, it was great.